Hi guys, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Rebecca Lysash, I'm the Graduate Assistant in the Career Development Office, and I have the pleasure of introducing Mr. Bennett today. Mr. Bennett is the Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the Brookings Institution. He previously worked with many, uh, was the Executive Director and Founder for many different NGOs, and um, he's a graduate of Colgate University and has his Master's in Public Policy from Georgetown, but we'll listen to him anyway. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, no, I, I think I, I, I'm all set on the mic. Can you guys hear me all right? Um, yeah, so I, I went to Colgate. I, I, I did go to Georgetown, but, uh, uh, but I'm, a, I'm, I'm a diehard Syracuse fan, so uh, you, can, you, can actually, uh, you can actually do that. Um, so uh, I work at the Berkeley Institution, and, and just uh, by show of hands, so I'm not, I'm not boring you to death, how many people here know what the Berkeley Institution is? A good number of you. Um, let me just give you a sort of brief uh, summary of, of what Brookings is and what we do um, and what I think makes Brookings a little bit unique. And then I'll talk a little bit about, um, uh, about working at Brookings and how um, people coming out of graduate school or, or indeed even undergraduate uh, can get a job at Brookings and then I will shut up and let you ask me questions. Does that sound like a good idea? Good. Um, all right, so uh, Brookings w was started uh, nearly 100 years ago. We are approaching our centenary. Um, it was, uh, it's an interesting place insofar as it was started by uh, a guy named Robert S. Brookings, who was a Republican businessman from the Midwest, uh, who made a fortune making something called woodenware, which I don't entirely know what that is, but I think it, I, I always imagine it being sort of, uh, 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 spools for, for thread and th things that people needed who were going out to settle out west. And this was in the late 19th century. And uh, he made uh, his fortune at a, at a company called Couples and Sons. And um, it, it, he, he wound up running it. He made uh, millions in St. Louis. And he was not a founder, but one of the original benefactors was, uh, was a, the chair of the board and the chancellor at various times of Washington University in St. Louis. In fact, you send a letter to Washington University in St. Louis, you, every letter you send goes to one Brookings place. So uh, Robert S. Brookings is important for them. But in, in 1916, he was called East by, here a Republican businessman from the Midwest, was called East by a uh, Democratic uh, president from New Jersey um, to help uh, get the country ready for entry into World War I. And he was, uh, he, his, he was charged with um, getting the, the private sector ready to, uh, to help the federal government in what was the biggest national mobilization since the Civil War. Um, and what he saw when he started this project was appalling to him, that the federal government um, was hopelessly unprepared for entry into World War I. They simply didn't have the um, internal uh, capabilities. They didn't have the analytical capacity, they didn't have the staffing, they didn't have the working knowledge of, they didn't even know how to talk to the private sector. And so he uh, organized the, the War Preparedness Board and, and, and did that. And, and on the side, he and a number of his, uh, of his board, fellow board members uh, started something called the Institute for Advanced Study. And he did so, he called back to St. Louis um, and, and asked his friends on the, uh, on, at the university, he said, can we, can we open this, an office of, of Washington University in, uh, in, in uh, DC? And, and the answer was pretty much resoundingly, no, we don't want anything to do with what you're doing in, in, in DC, just do what you're doing and then come back to St. Louis as quickly as possible and give us more money. Um, he uh, wound up staying in DC, he and his wife um, stayed in DC, he passed uh, away and, and his wife uh, took over. Uh, they, they actually founded several institutes, uh, basically with the pr with the principal charge of helping the federal government analyze its problems uh, in a in a more um, meaningful and fulsome way. His observation was that that federal bureaucrats are generally were generally unprepared for their jobs. A and B, even when they were prepared for their jobs, they simply didn't have the tools or the um, I guess we would call it in, in this day and age, the altitude. They, they, were, they were operating at 10 feet uh, off the policy floor and he, 
he felt that, that to make good policy, you needed to be at 50,000 feet. You needed, to have a, you needed to have a broader view of the policy landscape. Uh, that was essentially what he was saying, is there was no analytical capacity for the federal government at the time. And, um, and so the Institute for Advanced Study and, and the other uh, organizations that he founded that ultimately, um, after he passed away and his wife donated a bunch of money to, to those institutions, became the Brookings Institution in the, in the early 20s. The Brookings Institution is um, one of the oldest think tanks in the United States. Um, it's not the oldest, but it's, it's up there. Um, it is uh, one of the things that the original charges of, of Brookings was to, um, to, to conduct independent, high-quality analysis for the government, but also to train the federal workforce. That was one of the core missions of, of Brookings, was to train the federal workforce. And so until the early 50s, Brookings was issuing PhDs. So mostly in, um, in economics, but, but some in political science. Um, and so there are still some people out there with, with, uh, with PhDs from the Brookings Institution. We realized in the, in the mid-50s that that's not where we wanted to be. That uh, being a degree-conferring organization was not why the top minds came to Brookings to, to think and to write, and, um, and it wasn't part of the core competencies of the organization. The core competency of the organization is to, um, is to create high-quality, uh, dispassionate, truly independent policy analysis for the government. Now, as a think tank, we are unique in a couple of ways. And I'm going to elide into, this is, I'm talking history now, I'm going to get to the present in just a second. We're unique in the think tank community in a couple of ways. There's, you can bucket think tanks. There's, there's thousands of think tanks in the world. There's 2,000 in the U.S. alone. Um, and many of them are very issue specific. They're think tanks on Latin America. They're think tanks on the federal budget. They're think tanks on uh, transportation policy. There's, a, there's basically a think tank for everything. There's a handful of think tanks out there that are interdisciplinary. They are multidisciplinary uh, operations. They're essentially universities without students. Um, and Brookings is one of those. Now, among, in that class of interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary think tanks, Brookings is unique in the following ways. They are either of the big, so there's 2,000 think tanks in the US. Um, most of them are issue specific um, or just have a, have a very narrow band of issues that they look at. So that's, that's uh, of the 2,000, let's say, 1,800 are in that category. Of the other 200, um, there are many that, are, that fall into essentially what you would think of as a partisan think tank. They have a political agenda. Now, in their mission statement, they'll all say that they do fact-based independent analysis to promote conservative ideals, or fact-based independent analysis to promote progressive or liberal ideals or, con or libertarian ideals. It doesn't matter. There's no shame in it. It just is what it is. It's, but it's, a di it's something different than what Brookings does. These organizations can be very large. There's the Center for American Progress. There's the Heritage Foundation. There's the Cato Institute. These are, these, um, most of these organizations do very good work. Even if you don't agree with what they're saying, most of them are still producing high quality um, independent, uh, high quality uh, research. It's not necessarily independent in the way that Brookings thinks of independence. Um, then there's another category of large interdisciplinary think tanks. They are, uh, they're mostly funded by the federal government to do um, essentially knowledge generation for public consumption. These include the RAND Corporation, which does a lot of work for the intelligence community, for the defense community. Um, there's the National Opinion Research Center, which runs huge surveys, and, and they do a lot of work for the, uh, the health and human services sector. And, um, you know, they do some defense and intelligence work uh, as well. These are big, essentially, federal contractor organizations that are also think tanks. That, uh, they are truly independent. They, they don't have a political agenda at all. Uh, and that's, that's all, that's fine or not fine, it doesn't matter. Um, but they have a different business model than Brookings. Brookings is one of the very few, in fact, it's really the only truly interdisciplinary, very large think tank that has, A, no political, particular political agenda, 
and B, uh, does not primarily serve the federal government. Um, which is, if you're looking at it from a funding perspective and you're sitting in my seat as chief operating officer, that's a double bad, right? Because you don't get the partisans who want to fund you. You don't get sort of the Koch brothers on the right who, who will give you, write you a gargantuan check to, to go off and promote conservative ideals. You don't get the George Soros's on the left who, uh, who will write you a gargantuan check to, do, to promote liberal or progressive ideals. So we don't get the partisan money, and we don't get federal money. We, we get a little bit of federal funding, but we seek federal funding only in grant form. We never seek federal contracts because we don't do what's called research for hire. Um, so we do truly independent research that we have to get funded through other means. And the means that we get funded is mostly from foundations, um, from, from individuals, and we get a little bit of money from, from country governments, some US government, some foreign government, um, and a little bit of corporate money, but not very much. Now, why would somebody fund Brookings, right? Why would, why would anybody write a check to Brookings? Now, a foundation would, because a foundation has to give millions and millions of dollars away every year, and Brookings does very high quality stuff, has a very good reputation, um, and delivers a very, very high quality product. Um, why would an individual give money to Brookings? Um, certainly not to advance a political agenda. Um, and they, they give to Brookings because they perceive that Brookings is a place that can get things done, that has influence over the public policy debate, that we either um, shape, the, we, we either introduce the idea, new ideas into the policy stream, we shape the debate around those ideas, or we set the agenda on those ideas, or we even, in some cases, design the implementation of those ideas. Um, that's basically what a think tank is supposed to do, and that's, and Brookings has a 100-year track record of showing that we have done that in lots and lots of different parts of, uh, of the policy waterfront. Fact is, Brookings uh, uh, has done work on just about everything uh, in, on the policy waterfront. Currently, we have, uh, there's five programs. They operate like schools in a university, not like departments in a school, but schools in the university. They're um, economic studies, foreign policy, um, uh, uh, governance studies, which is uh, sort of our political science department uh, to a certain extent, uh, global economy and development, and metropolitan policy program, which looks at, um, at policy issues from a state, local, and regional level. And not just, domestic, not just domestically, but internationally as well. So Brookings um, is, uh, is, seen, is widely perceived out there as being a very high quality shop that, does, that delivers uh, high impact work. That's, um, that's very good for us, but we have a, we, uh, and when I say we, I mean Brookings, but all think tanks, are facing some tough headwinds these days. Um, in this day and age, when you think of Washington, you think of a pretty dysfunctional place, I would imagine. Outside the Beltway, Washington does not have the greatest reputation in the world. Um, and if Brookings and other think tanks are seen as our value to donors and our value to the, to the community, to the, to, the, to, to the public, is that we're able to push the levers of power in Washington and influence the levers of power in Washington and set the agenda and shape the debate in Washington. Yet Washington hasn't actually committed an act of real genuine policy making in an awful long time. Then that's a problem for us, right? Um, that's a, it's sort of an existential challenge that, um, that the dysfunction at the federal level uh, creates a real problem for places like Brookings. It also creates a huge opportunity for places like Brookings. Brookings is, um, unlike a number of other think tanks, Brookings doesn't take policy positions on anything. Brookings, um, because, because we call ourselves an independent think tank, as an institution, we have no particular say on or, or policy uh, position on U.S. intervention in Syria, the, the budget standoff, uh, social security reform, name your policy. Brookings has no particular position on it. In fact, it explicitly has no position on it. 
Brookings scholars, on the other hand, have very robust positions on it. And sometimes we find ourselves in the perverse position where one Brookings scholar will have a position X on, uh, on a certain policy area, and another Brookings scholar will have position Y, which is very different than position X, uh, on the same set of policies. And they will look at uh, policy so long as they start from a question and they work their way to the answer and they do so in a way that is considered academically robust, that's good in, in the opinion of, of, the, of the management uh, and, the, and the scholarly community at Brookings, even if those answers come out diametrically different. Here's an example for you. When your dean was the, uh, was the vice president of our foreign policy program at Brookings, we, it was uh, at the beginning of the, it was before the Iraq war. And um, we had one scholar who uh, looked at this set of facts and his own experience and his experience uh, before he went to Brookings. And he concluded that it was, there was grounds for US invasion in, in Iraq. Another scholar looked at the same set of facts from his experience and used an equally rigorous scholarly position to come up with exactly the opposite um, answer. So over here on the pro, on the invade Iraq side is, is Ken Pollock. Over here on the don't invade Iraq side is Evo Dalder, both senior fellows in our foreign, foreign policy program. So we had a debate in our main auditorium in Brookings where Evo and, and, uh, and Ken debated each other. It was really quite a, quite a remarkable thing from what I understand. This predated me a little bit before I got to Brookings. But it didn't predate Jim Steinberg, so you can ask him about it sometime. Um, the, the long and the short of it is that unlike a, most think tanks in the world, um, except for the, the sort of RANDs and the National Opinion Research Centers and the big federal contractors, you won't see a policy position coming out of Brookings. You'll see it coming out of the mouth of a Brookings scholar. Now, let me talk a little bit about Brookings and then allied into how it affects you guys. Um, Brookings, uh, we have about 450 resident staff at Brookings. And of those, about uh, a little more than two thirds work in the research programs. In addition to that, we have about another 450, 500, what we call affiliates. And these are people who are non-resident fellows. Um, does uh, anybody here take a class with uh, uh, Professor Wilcoxon? Well, he is a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. You should ask him sometime. He works on our climate and energy economics program. He is a uh, climate modeler. He's a really smart guy and a totally great guy. And he works here at, at Syracuse University. And there are people like Pete all over the world. Pete works with another non-resident senior fellow, a guy named uh, Warwick McKibben, who teaches at Australian National University. Um, and he cut the, both Pete and Warwick come to Washington on a fairly regular basis to oversee the work of our climate and energy economics program, which is really doing some quite amazing things. And, and uh, I see great things in the future for both Pete and Warwick and that whole program. They're going to do terrific things together. That, is a, uh, that reflects extraordinarily well on Syracuse, and it reflects extraordinarily well on Brookings. And I think that the policy recommendations that come out of the, uh, the program that they run are really quite amazing. But of those 450 people who work at Brookings and the other 500 who don't work at Brookings, they need staff, right? They need staff. There's, there's only about 120 resident scholars at Brookings. But those scholars have a whole network of support that, um, that are everything from RAs um, to, see, to uh, uh, if you go up the sort of food chain from research assistant, senior research assistant, research analyst, senior research analyst, um, research associate, senior research associate, and then associate fellow, which is the first level of scholarship at Brookings. So there are many research jobs, many scholarship uh, uh, policy analysis jobs at Brookings. If you, are, um, if you know STATA or SPSS or SAS or one of the main statistical packages, um, our, in our global economy and development program and our economics shop, there are lots of jobs for people who are good number crunchers. There always are. There's huge churn at Brookings um, for, the, for the sort of junior staff um, uh, research assistant types. 
Um, for the more senior positions, they, they almost certainly go to people with master's degrees, sometimes even with, or who are either PhD candidates or, P, or actually hold a PhD. Um, the, the, a senior research analyst, somebody could be a senior research analyst for 10 years at Brookings. There's less of churn at that level. But these are folks who are, who are authoring papers and getting published all the time. Um, they're, and then uh, eventually, uh, you, the, the highest form of life at Brookings is not a vice president like me. The highest form of life is a senior fellow. And a senior fellow is, um, is a, it's akin to a tenured faculty member at, at, at a university. Um, there's a fellow which is akin to an associate faculty member at a university. Um, and uh, th there are, the different disciplines have different criteria for entry into those positions. It almost always requires either significant government service or um, significant uh, service in academia and with a long list of, of publications to your name to, to become a senior fellow at Brookings. But it has been known to happen that people have started at Brookings as a research assistant and have wound up later in their career as a, as a senior fellow. There's some actually some famous cases of it. One case is, um, is Alice Rivlin. Has anybody here heard of Alice Rivlin? Alice Rivlin is one of the most famous American economists um, out there. She was on the, uh, she was on the, the, the uh, Bowles-Simpson um, committee to, uh, to solve the debt crisis, which went exactly nowhere. But before that, uh, she had some more triumphant experiences in government, including in, uh, she started her career uh, after she got out of college. She started her career at Brookings as a research assistant in 1958. Um, she then uh, went on and uh, went into academia. She came back to Brookings as a, as a fellow. Um, she then was recruited by, uh, uh, by President Kennedy to run, uh, to be an assistant secretary in the Department of um, Health, Education, and Welfare, which doesn't exist anymore. It's now Health and Human Services and, and, and Housing and Urban Development. But she was an assistant secretary in Health, Education, and Welfare. She then came back to Brookings as, and this time as a senior fellow. And a few years later, she, um, she, after some rigorous analysis, decided, you know, Congress really needs its own independent budgeting shop. There is no place where, the, where Congress can validate its budget numbers. They either have to hear it from the Republican National Committee or the Democratic National Committee or from the, the, the president's own budget shop, the, the Office on Management and Budget. And if you're in the opposition, you don't necessarily trust that. And so she invented, in a research paper, something called the Congressional Budget Office. It was submitted to Congress. Congress kind of liked that idea. They invented the Congressional Budget Office and asked her to be the first director of it. So she ran the Congressional Budget Office. Then she came back to Brookings as a senior fellow. She then did that for a while. And then um, how many of you all recall um, a mayor of Washington, D.C. named Marion Barry? Any, any hands? Marion Barry got sent to jail for doing all kinds of nasty and unpleasant things, which we're not going to get into right now. Um, and when uh, and, uh, he, he went to jail, he was re replaced by somebody else, and he somehow got himself reelected as mayor of, of Washington, D.C. in the early 90s. It was rather astonishing to those of us who lived there that this could actually come to pass, but alas, it did. And he ran the, the city so poorly that Congress essentially took receivership of Washington, D.C., much like the state of Michigan has taken receivership over Detroit. The receiver of Washington, D.C. was Alice Rivlin. So she went off and ran Washington, D.C. as the sort of de facto mayor for a few years, and then she came back to Brookings. So we have a revolving door at Brookings that has some people who've been there an astoundingly long time. Steve Hess, he's a senior fellow in our, in our governance studies program. He started at Brookings uh, shortly after he wrapped up his stint in the Eisenhower administration as a speechwriter. And he came as a, as a, as a uh, research assistant, and he's been a senior fellow there since forever. So people uh, come to Brookings and sometimes they stay for an awful long time. Sometimes they stay and they go and they come and they go and they go and they come. And um, uh, so it, it is not at all unusual that, that, there, that people can have lots of different affiliations with Brookings. Now for you, how many of you are graduate students? 
Okay, most of you are graduate students, and, and how many of you are, uh, are uh, barreling towards graduation this May? Okay, uh, all right, well, May, June-ish, you know, uh, sometime at, towards the end of the year. Um, Brookings is on a sort of classic academic hiring cycle. We see a rush of incoming people in the May-June range, and uh, we also see a rush of incoming people in the December-January range. That roughly coincides when people get their degrees and graduate from graduate school. RAs at Brookings tend to be graduate students or, or graduates of graduate schools. Um, that is, uh, it's because we can. Um, you know, there's a lot of other think tanks in Washington and around the country that, that hire undergraduates um, to do everything from research assistants to being in the communications apparatus and the impact. Um, one of the things that, that, that our scholars don't really know how to do very well is we used to talk about the 24-hour news cycle, right? And sort of staying on top of the 24-hour news cycle meant thinking about communications in a totally different way. Well, we're now talking about a 140-character news cycle. And here's a, a culture of a think tank that's been around for 100 years. We have our own academic press. We publish books and articles and monographs and long pieces. And now we have to tweet, too? Um, and so getting a, that sort of transitioning the culture of Brookings to the 21st century to utilize all the tools of communication and impact that are out there is a vitally important thing. And so we look to people like you who actually know what the hell they're talking about when it comes to social media um, to teach the scholars who generally don't um, or don't know how to use it very well how to utilize the tools of tomorrow. Um, we have a communications office. We, we, we spend quite a lot of money on communications at Brookings. Um, and uh, it's because a think tank is only as good as the impact that it can get. And impact comes in lots of different forms. Impact comes in the form of getting legislation passed is the highest form of impact, I suppose. Um, but below that is uh, reaching the general public and, and making your policy ideas understandable, making it part of the, of the, of the common debate, making it, uh, having it talked about, um, not just around congressional water cooler, coolers, but around every water cooler. And that's becoming more and more difficult as traditional media is, begins to fade. And I look to my right down to the Newhouse School and wonder what they're doing down there to, to approach this problem. At Brookings, we are um, constantly trying to evaluate and reevaluate our impact and the way that we're doing communication. So we need people who are smart about policy, meaning graduate students of the best policy schools in the country, like Maxwell, to come and help us think about these things, how to be more impactful when Washington is seen as a completely paralyzed state, when uh, the, the traditional media is fading away, um, when uh, bookstores are by and large gone, we really need to change the way we think about things. And we are, but, but this is a cycle of continuous improvement, and we need help with that. And so uh, as I think about openings at Brookings and job openings and how young people or, 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 or people who come right out of places like Maxwell can get jobs at Brookings, it's in our communications department. Some it's research assistants and it's, it's, it's helping our scholars think the thoughts that they need to think and produce their manuscripts and, and their, their op-eds for the New York Times and their tweets. But it's also in our communications department. It's also putting on events. We, Brookings is seen as one of the venues in Washington where people from both sides of the aisle and in fact all over the world come to float policy ideas. So on one day we'll have Eric Cantor. On another day we might have Nancy Pelosi. On a third day we might have the premier of China who, uh, who is speaking on stage at the Falk Auditorium at Brookings. We run, we have 19 conference rooms that are constantly being used. It is a venue in Washington that is seen as open to all. And um, we need people to help us craft the programming that goes into those conferences. We spend a great deal of money on conferences too. 
So there's lots, as you think about your careers, you might think about uh, Congress, and that's certainly one place to go. Um, you can think about uh, an advocacy organization, like uh, an environmental advocacy organization, or a, you know, there's, a, there's literally advocacy organizations for everything from the environment to guns to uh, transportation to you name it. Um, there's, there, are, um, there are contractor organizations that do, the, do a lot of the work of the federal government. USAID contracts out almost all of the money that they give goes to American corporations. Um, the same with, with, with all of the federal agencies. Let me start on a somewhat more positive note than I, uh, let me end on a somewhat more positive note than I started. Washington may be a morass, right? It may be that, that Congress and the, and the presidency will be uh, paralyzed in a, in, a, um, in a pissing match through the end of the Obama administration and through the next administration. It may very well be that there is legislative versus executive paralysis. But below the level of Congress, when the government is open, which is usually, except when it's not, um, uh, there is actually quite a lot of policy making that has to happen. Hundreds of billions of dollars get pumped into the system every year. And that money needs to be spent smartly. Um, and the federal, as Robert S. Brookings observed 100 years ago, the federal government just isn't very good at thinking about how to spend money smartly. And so for you, the public policy student, um, there, are, there is vast opportunity in the federal government to help them think more smartly about spending their money. So with that, let me shut up and let me let you ask me questions about job opportunities or anything that's on your mind on, on, uh, on Brookings. You mentioned some countries contribute to the Brookings Institution. I'm sorry, say again? Some countries contribute to the Brookings. Yeah. Are you able to go kind of in the back door and repair some of the damage that's being done by Washington non-activity that way? Well, uh, let, me, let me answer. There's two, two different questions, and let me answer them each because they're both good questions. Brookings does receive foreign government assistance. We receive it because it generally comes with a lot less strings attached than, than American government assistance. If you want to help the U.S. government, most of the money goes out there in contracts so that the research that you do belongs to the federal government. That's unacceptable to Brookings. That's research for hire, and we don't do it. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's fine, but that's for RAND to do. That is for the National Opinion Research Center to do. That is for any number of, of for-profit contractors to do. Foreign governments tend to come to us with, with far fewer strings attached. The Norwegians, who are awash in, in oil money, come to us and say, we care very deeply about the environment, which is sort of ironic, but nevertheless, there it is. They are an, a, a, an Arctic state, and they see the dangers of, of, uh, of climate change. Um, yet they are, their money comes from petroleum. Uh, who cares? Whatever. They want to fund our, uh, our environmental, uh, our, our energy security initiative or, or our um, climate and energy economics project or any number of the things that we're doing on climate change. That's great. We'll take their money. So they'll come to us and say, we would like to fund Brookings' work on climate change. And we say, that's great. Or we would like to fund, Brook so the Norwegians are extraordinarily expansive, and they, they fund lots and lots of different things. We would like to fund uh, Brookings' work on the Arab Spring. Okay, well, that sounds great to us. So there's very little, I mean, the, the strings attached are they want to be kept in the loop. They want to get some briefings from time to time. They want us to show up to the conferences that they hold in Oslo at miserable times of year. So, uh, you know, our scholars have to schlep to Oslo in February, which is really not a great time to be in Norway. But, uh, but so that's the strings that are attached to the foreign money. We also get foreign money from, um, from less, uh, let's say, uh, states that have less of a uh, benign reputation as Nor than Norway. Um, the, the Qatari government gives us quite a bit of money. Um, and the money that they give us is to run the U.S. and the Islamic World Project. 
Um, now, they don't tell us what we're supposed to say. They don't tell us how we're supposed to say it. But they, we propose to them that they fund something that we call the U.S. and the Islamic World Project, which is essentially getting to your second question, U.S. public diplomacy. Okay? This started during the, uh, right after the beginning of the Iraq War when the U.S. reputation in the region was horrendous. The U.S. public diplomacy in the region was beyond horrendous. And the Qataris, who are, generally speaking, a complicated but more forward-leaning or forward-looking or progressive uh, government than most in the Middle East, um, you know, they, they said, we would love to host that here in Doha. And we are prepared to give you a, what was at the time and today, a fairly large amount of money to run this U.S. and the Islamic World project, to essentially explore what is the role of the U.S. in the Islamic world. And, you know, look at it from whatever angle you see fit, but we think you guys are the right shop to do it. And so the Qataris funded us to run that project. And it, it, it actually has been a very interesting project to run. Um, we get small amounts of money from other country governments, nothing particularly of, of any particular substance within our, within our total budget framework. Um, about 13% of our funding comes from our endowment. Um, the vast majority of the, re of the remaining 87% comes from foundations and individuals with about 10% of the remainder coming from, from corporations and country governments. And um, so are we there to repair the work of uh, the, the bad stuff that the U.S. does? Well, yeah. I mean, I think that's kind of what Brookings does in general, uh, that, that we, um, we view our role as helping the U.S. government improve its performance in foreign policy, in international relations and diplomacy, um, and in, in, in uh, economic and fiscal policy, in, um, in the way that it does infrastructure investment, in the way it does agricultural investment. Across the policy waterfront, we view our role as helping the federal government perform better. And if we don't take federal government money, that gives us an added level of independence from the federal government and, frankly, credibility on Capitol Hill. Now, to that point on credibility mm -hmm. on Capitol Hill, if you ask most Hill staffers, what do you think of Brookings? Republicans will say, ah, they're liberal. And Democrats will say, oh, they're sort of moderate, fence-sitting, milk-toast, middle-of-the-roaders. If you ask the same staffers, and we actually did this because we focus grouped a bunch of, of Hill staffers, if you had to get a report on any topic, say climate change, say infrastructure policy, say whatever, um, and you had a report from Heritage, Cato, CAP, uh, uh, RAND, and they list off the major think tanks, and Brookings, which one would you pick? And they all, all of them, left and right, said we'd pick the Brookings report first. So scratching the surface, our reputation has ebbed and flowed over time. It's gone from left, we were, way back when we were seen as complete conservatives, the Roosevelt administration first loved us, then hated us. So we've, we've, the pendulum has swung back and forth on our reputation, but the methodology has remained the same. That, uh, that we are an independent operation, that we have no particular political agenda, um, and uh, our scholars might, but we don't. Other questions? Yeah, right there. Um, you mentioned five different schools that you focus on. And I was wondering how much of your research is interconnecting between those uh, schools. And a totally different question is, what kind of skills are you looking for in uh, research assistants? Two good questions. Um, all right, by show of hands, um, how many people here uh, have uh, majors in two different schools. Do you find it somewhat challenging to navigate between two schools? Not really. Uh, maybe the student experience is a little different. Generally speaking, in, uh, in academia, getting political scientists and economists, all due respect to the political scientists who might be here, uh, to work together and see eye to eye is a little bit challenging. Interdisciplinary work in any university setting is generally hard to pull off. Um, 
But we try, we try like hell to pull it off because we figure we should be more than the sum of our parts, right? Though that's a mathematical impossibility, we should be more than the sum of our parts. If we have an economist over here who's working on, on, uh, on climate change modeling and we have a political scientist over here who's looking at the, um, at the political dimensions of, of climate change legislation, the two of them together should be able to do, make beautiful music and should be able to get more impact. And we have invested a fairly large amount of institutional resources in getting our scholars to work together. And sometimes it works brilliantly, as in climate and energy. It works really, really well in climate and energy. And sometimes it doesn't work very well at all. Largely, it, I think it has to do with disciplinary um, factionalism. That is, you'll find in any university setting. Um, who here is an economics major or an economics professor? I don't want to. I don't want to insult anybody. They don't call it the dismal science for nothing. Okay, they there is a. They are. Uh, they're a grumpy lot. Uh, they they tend to think that they they know better than everybody else, and oftentimes they're right. Okay, um, the the political scientists and, and and economists oftentimes just plain don't get along that well. And so if you create a program where you're asking political scientists and economists to work together, you need to give them some incentive to do so. And oftentimes that incentive is monetary, and oftentimes that incentive is, um, uh, is the access to better impact tools. In any event, you have to put something in front of most senior fellows who act like tenured faculty members that they could do whatever they want, right? They'll pursue whatever research agenda they want to pursue. And if they, if you're asking them to work with somebody whose work they don't particularly think is that great or robust, or they don't follow the appropriate social science, uh, scientific uh, methodologies, it's harder, right? But Brookings, we uh, we allow a thousand flowers to bloom, and and sometimes we we try to to uh, to plant the seeds together. Uh, oftentimes that bit of gardening requires some money that we sprinkle on top of it. So um, in terms of leveraging our, our, um, the skill sets that we have in, in our governance studies versus our economic studies and our foreign policy program, it's hard but not impossible and we spend a lot of, I spend a lot of my time doing that and thinking about that. Now in terms of the skills that we're looking for, name a skill, we're probably looking for it. If you're a, if you're a chef, no, we're probably not looking for that. Um, although it could come in handy from time to time. Um, but if you if you have um, if you have if you if you have uh, if you're a communications major, if you have um, if you're an excellent writer, if you have published material, um, if you uh, have experience with economic with statistical research programs, um, Stata, SPSS, or SAS, um, three of our five main research programs do a lot of that. If you have, if you are good with uh, computer graphics and you have experience in, um, in uh, generating good computer graphics, data visualization is all the rage these days. So making your analysis into a picture that is projectable on the web or on Twitter or on Facebook or on any number of platforms is really important. Um, understanding what makes a good tweet and what makes a bad tweet. I can't believe I'm actually saying that but uh, uh, because five years ago I didn't know what Twitter was. But what makes a good tweet and what makes a bad tweet, there's a, you know what they are. You, 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 who's on Twitter here by show of hands? All right, enough of you to know that there, there are people who tweet well and there are people who tweet really poorly, right? Um, it is uh, these tools, being able to change the way that we project our research. We really have to do that. That is a major undertaking of the institution. To not to abandon our book culture because books will are and will remain an important part of Brookings output. But the new media requires a new way of thinking about things. So if you have experience in, in uh, motion graphics, in graphic data visualization, in graphing things, in 
uh, in number crunching of any kind, be it uh, from, uh, uh, from social modeling to, um, to statistical research. Those are the kind of hard skills we look at. We also need some, some softer skills. We need skills on organizing. You know, we, need to know, we need people who know how to organize an event, right? That's not an easy thing. Not just filling a room, but filling a room with the right people. Because if you fill a room with the wrong people, well, it costs a lot of money to put on a conference. And you've just spent a lot of money for very little actual value. So filling a room with the right people. We do 270 public events a year. We probably do the same number of invitation-only events a year. That's a lot of events. And that means we need a whole staff of people who know how to fill a room with the right people. So we need a whole bunch of different kinds of skills. A lot of them are communications and impact oriented. A lot of them are sort of uh, are writing and, and analysis oriented. Does that answer your question? Other questions? Yeah, right here. Hello. Um, what is the best way for a grad student to get their foot in the door at Brookings, whether it's in the communications department or as an RA? Um, yes. Look, there, we, there's, there's needs everywhere, um, and uh, it, it's somewhat an, of an opportunistic exercise. You need to look at what Brookings is looking for and then craft your approach to Brookings in the appropriate way. And this goes, this, this is not just Brookings exclusive. This is, this is me just talking to you as um, I, I am in the world of work, you are about to enter it, and uh, this is just basic uh, job entry 101, right? Know the organization you're applying to. It's very easy to know it now because everybody's got a website, everybody's got a Twitter feed, everybody's got a Facebook page. It's not hard to learn a lot about the organization that you're applying to. Learn about the job that you're applying to. It's not hard to do that either. Uh, you go to, in, Brook, in the example of Brookings, you go to the Brookings website, you see that the foreign policy program is looking for a web coordinator. So you find out who's in the foreign policy program, whose books you've read, or whose books you read a little bit of, or who you really admire, who you saw on TV the night before, and you put all that in your cover letter, right? For, our, for your standard RA position at Brookings, we'll get somewhere between 500 and 900 applications, okay? Now, we have a screening device that screens out people who don't meet the minimum qualifications. Most employers have this. So of those, let's say, 700 applications, let's say half of them are, don't meet the minimum qualifications and they get, they get screened out by the robot. That means 350 did. And so you're, you are in competition with 350 other people. And to make your resume known, it helps to drop a name of somebody who you might know from that organization. Like, I studied with Jim Steinberg, who was obviously well known to Brookings. Or um, I heard Steve Bennett speak, and uh, we had a nice conversation uh, in October of 2013. Um, putting down sort of obvious things, and, and then go on to say, if the job is in foreign policy, say, I've read a great deal of Tammy Wittes' work. She was talking about the, the um, uh, about Arab democracy before anyone thought that Arab democracy was even a the remote possibility, uh, much less the, the cause of, of enormous tumult in, in North Africa and the Middle East. So just do a little research and, and make it obvious to the person who's doing the first screening that you know the organization and this is the place that you would chew off your right arm to work at, right? That's essentially job number one, is getting your resume not immediately put in this pile, which goes straight to the thanks but no thanks uh, responses, but in this pile, which goes to the um, which goes to the next level of screening. So uh, the basic, the the long and the short of it is, um, get to know the organization that you're applying for, and the more focused you can be about um, about why you're perfect for the job, 
Um, and, you know, I'm not telling anyone to lie about anything, but just do your research. By doing your research, suggest that you are, suggest to an employer that you're seriously motivated about getting a job. And if you, if I were the hiring officer and your resume came across my desk and it said, I love Brookings, I've always loved Brookings, um, here's what I love about Brookings. Not just I love Brookings, but here's, here's the things I particularly like. That actually catches your eye. It matters. Um, and then, you know, then, then it's up to you. Then it's, then it's you and the interviewer. And it's largely about chemistry. So for those of you who are going out into the job world and you get close three times and you don't get the job that you really want, understand that when you get down to the last five candidates for any job, it's, it's a very subjective thing from the, from the hiring side of the table. It's, you know, this person was a little bit more poised in their interview than that person. Uh, it, it, it pivots off the most subjective little, little things. So you can't take it too hard. Um, getting a job in a place like Brookings is hard. Um, it's extraordinarily selective, but it's not impossible. And just because you don't get selected for job A doesn't mean you shouldn't apply for job B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, and J. Keep trying. Persistence is, matters also. Yeah. Sir, I'm a uh, JD MPA student here. Uh, I'd be interested in uh, internships over the summer. Uh, I'm interested in foreign policy and national security. I was seeing um, what typically is available over the summer or, or sort of the timeline and, and really what uh, factors are you looking into when uh, scrutinizing re resumes uh, for those graduate internships? Um, internships are, uh, they, we take a lot of interns. We, we bring on about 80 interns for the summer, every summer. Um, for somebody who is a JD MPA uh, with an interest in national security, what I would naturally say to you would be you should reach out to a guy named Ben Wittes. Ben Wittes, is, uh, he works in our government studies program. He is a lawyer himself. He is quite prolific in, um, in his writing. He's written two books on the um, legal aspects of the global war on terror. He runs a blog called the Lawfare blog, which is pretty small. You, most people probably haven't heard of it. And um, here's the thing about the Lawfare blog. It's small, it's very targeted, and it's probably the highest impact tool that we have right now. Because of the 200 or so readers of Lawfare every single day, all 200 of them work in the general counsel's office of the executive office of the president, the Pentagon, the CIA, the National Security Agency. They are the lawyers that matter in the, in the area that we are talking about. And that, just because Ben, you won't see Ben on, on Fox News or CNN or anything like that. Uh, you might, but but that's not his shtick, right? His thing is talking to that very selected audience of people who he wants to talk to. So he needs an army of people to help him run this blog. Um, it's hard to run a blog all by yourself. And Brookings helps, we the employer, and we give him research assistants and interns and things like that, but, but ultimately it's up to him to make, the, make sure the thing goes out. He relies, on, on, uh, on interns, largely. There, there's another guy at, at Brookings, a guy named Peter Singer. He, he runs the Center for 21st Century Defense and Analysis, or something like that. It, was, it used to be called the 21st Century Defense Initiative, but it recently graduated from an initiative to a center, um, which uh, I, is a, too arcane and stupid to even go into right here, but I, bottom line is I can't remember what the name of his thing is. But, he basically is all about drones on the battlefield and, and, and unmanned, uh, unpersoned uh, uh, battlefield devices. He gets very deeply into the legal aspects of that. And um, 
you know, the rules of engagement are very different if the CIA is running a drone if, than if the Air Force is running a drone. And that's what Peter thinks about. So Peter uses, uh, uses a bunch of, of interns as well. On the how, I would say reach, find the scholar who you want to work for. They will post their internships eventually, probably in February. It's usually January, February when the research programs get around to posting on our website the internships, and that gives you the opportunity to apply. But if you reach out to the scholar ahead of time to say, I think your work is just awesome, and I would kill to be your intern, that's not a bad thing to do. That gets you on their radar screen and flags your resume for them a little bit later. Sir, I'm a second year PhD student in political science. Uh, I wanted to know if you have pre and post doc fellowships for PhD scholars. And if you do, and this is more of a logistical question, do you also sponsor visas for foreigners? Yeah. Um, we always we sponsor tons of visas. We have a whole department that deals with, with, uh, with, the, with the visa issues. Most of our global economy and development program are third party nationals. Um, so we have. Having visas is not an issue for, for Brookings. Um, the, uh, we used to have a pre-doc program called the Brookings Research Fellow, um, but we, that was, um, we killed that program in 2009, largely because we were in somewhat belt tightening mode after the financial crisis, but also because we found that uh, our political scientists and our foreign policy uh, types, our, our IR folks, they did like pre-docs. But our economists um, in our metro program, our economic studies program, and our global economy and development program, they really didn't like pre-docs that much. There's not a whole lot of use in the economics discipline for pre-doc. They much prefer a post-doc, right? And so we had this problem where only where less than half of our research programs were using this pre-doc program that was funded by the institution. So we killed it and we haven't revived it yet. There are a few um, postdoc programs um, at, uh, at Brookings. They, they uh, have a little bit of endowment uh, attached to them and so there's the Peckman Fellows in Economic Studies, there's um, there's the Pazvolsky Fellow in Global Economy and Development. There's some, there's some others that are, um, that are pre and postdoc programs. Um, they're mostly listed on our employment section of our website. You should look at them. They have, I would say that, that our pre and postdocs have diminished rather dramatically over time. Um, and it's mostly because uh, it's just not something our research, our scholars are interested in um, investing that kind of time and energy. That said, um, we do a great deal of work. I, I don't know um, what your discipline is and what your, what your area of study is, but, but some of our programs um, are basically formulated around, around pre-doc programs. So we have uh, our Center for East Asian Policy Studies brings in the best pre-doc scholars who are going to be the leaders of Japan, Korea, uh, Singapore, Taiwan, basically every Asian rim country except for China, which uh, they bring in sort of the best of the, and the brightest for about nine months. Um, we have other programs that do that as well. Our, our Center for the United States and Europe has a very small program with, uh, with, uh, with the, um, the sort of Eurasian countries uh, from Turkey all the way to the stands. So, um, so it's worth looking on the website to see what's available, but generally they have, they have ebbed quite a bit in terms of their availability. Any other questions? Well, this has been a pleasure talking to you all. Um, I actually have to go to the airport now, so this works out well for me and for you. You can go outside because it's lovely out there, and, um, and this is like the only lovely day in Syracuse, New York, and, uh, and I get to go to the airport. So uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, if you're ever in Washington, uh, please come and, uh, and, and, and let us know. 
Uh, I always make time for, uh, for, for um, Maxwell students, so please honestly don't, don't hesitate to, uh, to reach out if, um, if you're ever in the area or when your job search begins. But good luck to all of you and thank you for your time. Thank you.